Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for this lecture five of the Cricket South Africa Level One course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp, and my co host for this evening will be Tom Mokarosi. The format of tonight's lecture will be as follows I will kick off. And I will start with law 22 up until law 27. And then I'll hand over to Tom, who will cover laws 28 up until 31. Law 22 covers wide ball. And before I go into wide ball, I again want to emphasize uh, throughout uh, this course, we are covering the laws uh, of cricket. And wide ball is no exception. So we're covering the white ball law in Morday cricket. And I kept on using test match cricket as, as an example, or our example, which spans over two innings. So we will cover what the law say in Morday cricket, how to interpret the white ball law. We should not get confused with T20 or 50 over cricket, where there are playing conditions that, uh, that governs how to interpret and how to call a white ball. So you'll often see on TV, there are um, white lines or color lines in, in, um, in international cricket, and they are covered by playing conditions. So what does the law say in more day cricket when it comes to the white ball? So how do you judge a white in more day cricket? Law tell us, ball by being bowled by the bowler, not being a noble, it needs to pass wide of the striker, and that striker standing in a normal batting position. So passing wide of the striker, standing in a normal batting position. So what does wide of the striker mean? The law actually gives us a, a definition, and the law tells us passing wide of the striker means the ball will be considered passing wide of the striker unless it is sufficiently within reach of the striker to be able to hit it by the means of a normal cricket shot. So, according to the laws, that is how you judge a wide in modern cricket. So, the striker standing in, in a normal batting uh, position, if the ball passes wide of the striker, and what is the interpretation of passing wide of the striker? The striker needs to be able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot. If your answer to that question is yes, then it's not a wide. If your answer to the question is no, then you need to call and signal wide ball. For many a year, uh, I played the game for more than 20 years at club uh, level. I actually thought the return crease in more day cricket that is how you judge a wide ball. It's only once I did my, my level one course, as we're doing tonight, that I've actually found out that that is actually not how to judge a wide ball. According to the laws, striker standing in a normal batting position needs to be able to hit the ball with the means of a, by the means of a normal cricket shot. That is how you judge a, a wide. Then law tell us, uh, delivery to be wide, umpire needs to call and signal wide ball when it passes the striker's wicket and then call and signal wide uh, um, and then signal wide to the scorers again as soon as the ball is dead. So in terms of the calling and the signaling, signaling of wide, it is a, as soon as the umpire touches the ball or the delivery to be wide, the umpire then immediately to call and signal wide but that umpire needs to delay the call of wide and the signal until the ball passes the striker's wicket. Don't call it too soon. Sometimes the ball might look wide and you, you call it too soon and, we, and we'll, we'll go into in, in, uh, in, a, in a minute why you should not be calling wide too soon. But with, uh, with regards to the calling and the signaling of uh, wide, Umpire only to call and signal as soon as the ball passes the striker's wicket. 
Although, according to the laws of cricket, technically, the ball is actually wide from the instant that the bowler enters his or her delivery stride. So technically, that is, that is when the ball actually is, uh, is wide according to the laws of cricket. But importantly, umpires to only call and signal wide until it passes the striker's wicket. And the reason for that is you do not want to be revoking a call of wide because uh, it happened to me on uh, a few occasions that it was too early to call wide. Uh, you know, on one occasion, it was a spinner bowling and the ball looked wide and I called wide too quickly, but then the batter played a late cut shot and it went down to third man. So you can just imagine, yeah, I'm calling and signaling wide but the ball is going to the boundary because the batter played a late cut shot and it went to the boundary. Uh, I, I look like a fool. So this is uh, the main reason why you need to delay that call of white until it passes the striker's wicket. So practically what you do, uh, if the ball delivery is white, wait until it passes the striker's wicket. And if it passes and there's been no contact with the with the striker with the striker's bat or person, you then call and signal wide. And then after that, that is the call and signaling of that first wide is to inform the uh, the players, the batters, your your colleague of the calling of wide. And once the ball is dead, you now need to turn to the scorers and signal again and wait for them to acknowledge your your signal also the law tells us that the delivery will not be wide if a striker by moving either causes the ball to pass wide of the striker or by moving brings the ball sufficiently within reach to be able to hit it by the means of a normal cricket shot in these these days you often find batters moving so this is a judgment call. So you'll not call a, deal, a wide delivery if the striker, by uh, moving, either causes the ball to pass wide of him or her, or by moving, brings the ball within reach to be able to eat it by the means of a normal cricket shot. Ball is, does not become dead on the call of wide ball. So sometimes you'll call... Uh, the ball will be wide, will call and signal wide, it will go past the keeper and the batters would start running. They are allowed to run. That ball is not dead. Uh, uh, you'll see in a later slide that one of the met methods of being dismissed of a white ball is a run out, so ball not dead on the call of white. What is the penalty for a white? A one run penalty. As soon as you call white, uh, instant award of a one run to the Batting side. So runs resulting from a wide, how, how are they scored? All runs completed by the batters or a boundary allowance together with the penalty for the wide to be scored. So example of this, let's say the batters, it, the ball is wide, you call and signal wide, keeper misses it, and the batters run two runs. How many runs in total? Two for the runs that they ran and one for the wide, so three in total. Let's say the ball is wide, you call and signal wide, keep him assisted, and it actually goes over the boundary. How many runs in total? Five in total. Four for the, the boundary and one for uh, the wide, five in total. How will you signal that? You'll call and signal wide first. And let's say the batter now starts to run, the ball now goes past the keeper, and it goes, now goes over the boundary. You will then, as soon as the ball goes over the boundary, the ball is now dead. You will again signal wide to the scorers. Then you'll signal boundary four to the scorers, and you can repeat your wide ball signal uh, to the scorers, and you need to, uh, they need to acknowledge each um, signal separately. White will not be one of the valid balls of the over. And lastly, how can you be dismissed of a wide? There are four ways. Firstly, hit wicket 
is one of the ways to be dismissed of white. Obstructing the field is number two. Number three is you can be run out of a wide. And lastly, you can be stumped of a wide. Again, this is in green, so there is definitely a question in the exam on how to be dismissed of a wide. When it comes to buys and leg buys, so what are the difference? What is a buy and what is a leg buy? Let's start with what is a buy? So firstly, the ball delivered by the bowler, and let's assume that ball is not a wide, and the ball passes the striker without touching his or her bat or person. That is the only criteria that you need to look at when judging bias. Did the ball touch the bat or person of the striker? If your answer to that question is, no, it did not touch the bat or person to the or, um, or person of the striker. Then, and the, let's say the keeper misses it, the batters are allowed to take a run. So, what is the criteria? Should not be touching the bat or person. That is the question when it comes to buys that you need to ask yourself. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, one of the criteria is not whether the batter played a shot or not, will buys be allowed or not, we will get to when playing a shot or not when it comes to leg buys. But when it comes to buys, the only question that you need to ask yourself is, the ball that was bowled, did it touch the bat or person of, uh, of the striker? If the answer is no, you will then allow buys. And depending on how many runs they, they, they ran, let's say they, the keeper misses it, uh, ball doesn't touch bat or person of the striker, ball goes through the keeper's legs, they ran two, that will then be accredited as two buys in the uh, scorebook. How do you signal it? Uh, face the scorers, keep an open palm facing the scorers uh, with your hand above your head. Let's say the um, ball doesn't touch the battle person of the striker and it goes through the keeper's legs and it goes over the boundary. How do you signal? You first need to indicate that it is biased. It's important. Why do you need to indicate it's biased? Because if you don't signal bias, the scorers will think it, it touched the bat and it will, they will actually allocate runs to the striker. So you signal by and you'll signal boundary four to the scorers. And again, wait, um, they need to acknowledge um, uh, the uh, signals separately. So when it comes to leg buys, so we just heard when it comes to buys, it should not have touched the person or bat of the striker. When it comes to leg buys, now the ball being delivered. Now when leg buys, it strikes the person or the protective equipment of the striker. It's not the bat, it's either the person, anyway on the person, whether it's the pad, uh, the pad, the foot, the tummy, the back, uh, the, the helmet, anywhere. If it's anywhere on the person or the protective equipment of the striker, leg bias then to be scored. But for leg bias to be scored, there are two criteria or two conditions that needs to be in place. Number one, Either the striker needs to have attempted to play the ball with his or her bat. The uh, striker needed to attempt to play a shot. And in attempting to play a shot, let's say it then goes against the pad and then ricochets towards third man and they run, you'll allow that. That would be considered a leg by. Or the other condition, if the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball, let's say it's a short ball, the striker ducks, and it goes against the shoulder of the striker and ricochets to fine leg. Short ball, the striker tried to duck, to uh, try to avoid being hit by the ball. The ball then ricochets to fine leg and they run a, and they run a single. That would be considered a leg buy. So again, the, con the criteria and the conditions for leg buys, strike any part of the person or the protective equipment. And then the two conditions, the striker must attempt to play the ball with the bat or try to avoid being hit by the ball. If, if the delivery was a no ball, that no ball will always count and it will be added to the score as well.
So that's leg bias, and we went through the criteria for leg bias. So now we know when leg bias are awarded. When are leg bias not to be award, awarded? So remember, we spoke about, and I'll go back to the previous slide, the two bullet points, the two the conditions that needs to be in place for leg bias to be uh, awarded. So for leg bias not to be awarded, these two conditions should not be in place. So what, is, what, is, what, what do I mean? The striker, if the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his or her bat, or the striker did not try to avoid being hit by the ball, if this is the case, and the typical example, let's say striker uh, puts out the pad, shoulders, arms, the ball strikes the pad, and it now ricochets to fine leg. The law tell us because the striker did not attempt to play the ball with the bat or the other condition, and, uh, did not try to avoid being hit by the ball, leg buys do not be awarded. So now you'll often find, and because players didn't know the law, I mean, including uh, myself, I played the law, I played the game at club level for more than 20 years, thought I knew all the, I knew the laws, but um, we players well, did not know the laws. Only once I became an umpire did I actually um, start learning the laws. So now a player sold his arms, hit the pads, it goes to fine league, and now they start to run. The law tell us, Technically, they're not allowed to run, but you as the umpires will give the fielding side opportunity to try to run out either of the batters. They shouldn't run. They should know the law. But, but if they uh, decide to, to run, which many batters do, including me, I've done it many times, you only to call and signal dead ball as soon as the ball either reaches the boundary or as soon as the batters complete the first run. As soon as they, they, the batters now shouldered arms, ball hit the pad, Rika saves the third man who finally, they now start to run. As soon as they complete one run, then you call and signal dead ball. Or let's say the ball goes actually over the boundary. So now the ball's over the boundary, then the ball becomes dead, then you can call and signal dead ball. So we just now have said, leg bias should not be awarded, but let's use the example they ran a single. But we know now we now know that that one run should not have been awarded. So what do we do? After calling and signaling dead ball, we then need to disallow all the runs to the batting side, whether it's that single that they took, or whether it's uh, the 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 ball that went over a boundary. That boundary four to not be allowed. We disallow all the runs. If they ran a single, you need to make sure that you return um, the batters back to the original uh, ends. If there was a no ball, you need to signal it to the scorers. Uh, you'll award any five penalty runs, except if the ball should hit the protective helmets belonging to the fielding side. So now we've covered uh, leg bias. What is the definition of a leg bias as well as bias? When it comes to substitutes and what happens if a fielder is absent while play is in progress. Let's start with substitutes and see what the law say, what, the, um, what a substitute fielder, or when will we allow a substitute fielder? Law guides us by telling the umpires to allow a substitute fielder if the umpires are satisfied that a fielder has been injured or became ill, and that injury or illness occurred during this particular game. So if we're happy, or if we as umpires are happy that the uh, fielder became injured or ill, we will then allow, and that, Ill, uh, that injury or illness occurred during the game, we'll allow a substitute. So that is the criteria that we need to take into account to allow a substitute fielder. Injury or illness. So if a player comes to you, remember, we, we as umpires, we're not medical doctors. A player comes to you and a player tells you, umpire, I've injured my hamstring. I need to go off for treatment. You'll uh, allow the player to go off to get treatment and you'll then allow a substitute fielder to come um, field for that injured fielder. Second instance, when we'll allow a substitute fielder, 
the law say if there is a wholly acceptable reason we will you uh, we can then also allow a substitute um, fielder just an example of wholly acceptable reasons there are many uh, but i'll just give you a, one example in um, cricket south africa's domestic uh, uh, competition um, we play um, four day provincial uh, cricket and there are many um, students that do play in the pr provincial sites. They, uh, they currently studying at a tertiary um, institution. So at times, these students write exams. So usually our um, four day, uh, uh, four day game spans from uh, Thursday to Sunday. So sometimes, um, these uh, these students that is actually a player in the provincial site needs to write an exam uh, on a Saturday morning, and let's say the exam is from eight till twelve. They usually inform the um, the match referee uh, um, if a player is um, um, going to write the exam at provincial level. They actually do need to uh, provide a letter from the university confirming uh, the exam and the time span and that gets handed to the master referee. So the, what I'm um, what I'm showing is an example of a wholly acceptable reason. So this particular player is not, is not injured or ill, is now going to write an exam on the Saturday morning, will only be arriving at the field at 12 o'clock. So that is a wholly acceptable reason why that player is not uh, on the field of play and will then allow a substitute for that player. Law also guides us in terms of a substitute. As soon as you allow a substitute player to come onto the field for an injured player, that substitute is not allowed to bowl. That substitute may not bat, nor is that substitute allowed to be captain of the side. So not allowed to bowl, not allowed to bat, not allowed to captain the side. That substitute is only allowed to field in, in place of the injured a player or if there was a wholly acceptable reason. A reason addition to the law is uh, the, the lawmakers decided that we can allow the substitute to be a wicketkeeper, but only with the consent of the umpires. So if the substitute wants to keep, they first need to ask the, the umpire's permission. And if the umpires give consent, the substitute can then um, keep wicket. When it comes to a fielder being absent or leaving the field of play, before I go into um, uh, uh, what the law say how to treat this, uh, let me just tell you how players, including myself, how we abused uh, this law uh, many years ago. Players would uh, go to the umpire, say to the umpire, oh, umpire, my hamstring. Uh, umpire said, okay, hamstring, they're going to go for treatment. And they'll go and they'll uh, sit in the dressing room with their feet up. They're actually not injured. They just want to, to take a rest. And let's say an example, open, uh, opening bowler, after bowling a six over opening spell, would, uh, now wants to go off, would, they would fake an injury, tell the umpires my hamstring, would go off, take a shower, put feet up a little bit and come back uh, later on. Batters would also uh, abuse uh, uh, the law, um, knowing the side is eight down, um, they, the opening bat um, then say, umpire, I'm injured, opening bat would go off um, and then take a shower, put feet up a little, knowing that the UFC is going to bat um, soon because the, the batting side is eight down. So players abused uh, the, the law, faking uh, um, uh, injuries. Um, yes, there were some genuine ones, uh, but... There were definitely some players that fake uh, that uh, fake injuries just to uh, go take a rest. The lawmakers then decided to tweak this law. What changes did they make to this law? The lawmakers then changed. They said that if a fielder either fails to take the side uh, the field at the start of the game or the fielder leaves the field while plays in progress let's say the fielder comes to you say umpire i'm injured uh, I, wa I want to go off the lawmakers then uh, tell us that we'll allow it because we can allow a substitute for injury or illness 
Firstly, what you then need to do practically on the field of play, the player is now coming to you. You need to ask the player, um, the player needs to inform you why he or she is leaving um, the field. And let's say it's a hamstring. You'll then write down, um, let's say, um, player X leaving the field, hamstring injury. That's the first thing that you need to do. Secondly, you need to write down the time that the injured player left the field of play. We're going to see um, in a minute or two the importance of why you're writing down the time that the injured player left the field uh, of play. But a practical um, um, advice, when the player leaves the field of, of play, you write down his or her name and the time. Just before the player leaves, you tell that player, when before you come back onto the field, please inform either of the two umpires when you're returning to the field of play after receiving uh, treatment. You'll see there are two important reasons why you need to firstly write down when the player leaves and you need to know when that player comes uh, uh, back. We'll, we'll cover the first important reason now. And the second important reason is if a player do comes back without permission and touches the ball, it's quite a harsh penalty, but we'll get to that in a slide or two. So point number two, you write down uh, the time. You tell that player, um, please, when you come back, let me know. Be, uh, so, so as soon as that player comes back, you then need to write down the time the player comes back. So why is it important to write down when the player leaves and when the player uh, comes back? Point number three explains why. So now the law tell us if a player leaves the field, so the, our player, and I'll use a, uh, an example to illustrate point number two, but I'll first tell you what the law what the law say how to treat this player. So that injured player, he or she shall now not be permitted to bowl until that injured player has been back on the field of play for the same amount of time, and this is known in the law as penalty time. So it needs to be back on the field for the same amount of time that the player was off the field, up to a max of 90 minutes. Let's use an example to illustrate what the law is trying to tell us in point number three. So injured fielder, let's, let's use... Um, Mary as an example. So Mary leaves the field at 10.30. Comes to the umpire. Umpire, I've injured my hamstring. You say, okay, Mary, injured hamstring. You write down in a notebook. Mary leaving the field, hamstring, 10.30. Practical tip. You tell Mary, Mary, before you come back onto the field after receiving treatment, please inform the two umpires, either of us, so that we know that you're returning. It's important because we need to know when you're returning because we need to write down when uh, you return. So as soon as Mary returns, and let's say in our example, Mary returns at 10.50. So, so Mary standing on the boundary, waves at the umpire, umpire, I'm back. You wave Mary to come on. You write down Mary back at 10.50. So now you need to calculate how much time Mary was off the field of play. So Mary left the field at 10.30, Mary came back at 10.50. So Mary was off for 20 minutes. Now the law tells us that, let's say Mary was a bowler, before Mary is allowed to bowl, Mary needs to be on the field of play for 20 minutes before Mary can bowl again. So if Mary returned at 10.50, Mary was off for 20 minutes, when can Mary bowl again? Correct at 11.10, 20 minutes later. So practically, you will tell Mary as soon as she comes back on the field, Mary, you off for 20, you were off for 20 minutes, so you need to be on the field for another 20 minutes before you can bowl again, so you can bowl again at 11.10. Also, another practical tip, as, uh, you'll inform Mary when she can bowl again. You will also inform her captain when Mary can bowl again. So that is just the concept of you need to serve that penalty time. So the same amount of time that you was off, that is the amount of time that you need to serve before you can bowl up to a max of 90. 
So what is this concept of a max of 90? Uh, I'll use an example. Let's say Mary leaves the field at 11 o'clock and tells you um, I've injured my hamstring. She only comes back at 4 o'clock. So Mary's been off for many hours. Let's say, um, I'm not going to count now, uh, excluding intervals, but let's say Mary's been off for four hours. So she re only returns at four o'clock. When can Mary bowl again? The law say max of 90 minutes. 90 minutes is the max penalty time that you can serve. So Mary can bowl again, even though she was off for four hours, she can bowl again at 17.30. How did I get to 17.30? Mary returned to the field at um, 1600 hours. So max was 90 minutes. So 90 minutes later is 17.30. Also, penalty time does not disappear. Lots of uh, players think that you go into the next, um, let's say next innings, you owe 50 minutes and now it's the end of the innings. Now um, this penalty time will now disappear. No, it carries forward into the next innings. Uh, lots of players think at the end of day one, you owe 60 minutes. Now it's the end of the day. Now the, the next morning, you'll st start on a clean slate. You don't owe any penalty time. No. Law tell us penalty time doesn't disappear. You, get, you carry it forward into the next innings or into the next day. You won't carry it forward into a next match. Once the match is done, uh, you know, uh, you'll uh, forget about it. But the game is still in progress. It gets carried into the next um, day or the next um, innings. Also, sometimes we'll find a player going off the field for 50 minutes. Then uh, the uh, player returns after 50. Then that player serves another uh, on the field for 20 minutes. Now they leave again after 20 minutes to, to receive treatment again for an injury. So law tell us you need to add up all those penalty time that the player was off the field. You need to add them up. Scheduled intervals. Your interval for tea, drinks, um, uh, lunch, um, change of innings, the, uh, these does not get added to uh, unserved penalty time, nor does it count as penalty time served. I'll use an example just to illustrate what this means. The um, injured player, let's use Mary again as an example, and let's say in our test match, lunch time is at 12, uh, at 12 o'clock. So at 11.30, Mary leaves the field. So remember, lunch is at 12 o'clock. So Mary leaves the field at 11.30, and we take lunch at 12 o'clock. When do we return after lunch? Lunch is 40 minutes, so we'll return at 12.40. So when we come back from lunch at 12.40, Mary walks out with her side. So after lunch, how much penalty time does Mary owe us? So Mary was off from 11.30 till 12 o'clock. So at the start of lunchtime, Mary owed us 30 minutes. So our lunchtime ended at 12.40. So as we come back from lunch, how much penalty time does Mary owe us? Mary only owes us 30 minutes. So Mary can bowl again at 13.10. How did I get 30 minutes? It's only time that Mary was not on the field of play while play was in progress. Penalty time is only time that an injured fielder was off while play in progress. You do not add scheduled intervals. You, you now don't say uh, Mary was off from 11.30 till 12, so that's 30 minutes. Our, our interval was 40 minutes. Now, at, uh, when we restart at 12.40, Mary owes us now 70 minutes. No, you do not add your scheduled intervals to any penalty time. Mary only owes us 30 minutes. How do we deal with an unscheduled break in place? Sometimes uh, it, it do rains. We just mentioned uh, examples of scheduled breaks, and those are intervals um, for like lunch, um, um, tea, 
um, change of innings, drinks. There are also uh, a term called, uh, in the law called an unscheduled break, breaks that wasn't planned. An example of this is rain, you know, bad light, lighting. These are all examples of unscheduled breaks. How do we handle an unscheduled break when it comes to penalty time that a player still um, uh, owes? And I'm gonna. We're not gonna go into so much detail when we. Uh, for those of you that's gonna join us for level two and level three. We are going to go in lots of detail when it comes to field this absence, um, how to handle uh, scheduled breaks, unscheduled breaks. I'm going to do lots of examples, but for the level uh, one course, I'm just giving you an idea how to handle um, if a player do leaves the field of play. So when it comes to unscheduled uh, uh, breaks, so firstly, if a fielder was on the field at the start of the break and that fielder take takes the field at the resumption of play, that fielder can offset the unscheduled break against any penalty time that the fielder um, owes. If the fielder was already off the field at the start of the interruption, that fielder needs to inform the umpire uh, in person. And if that fielder takes the field of the, uh, the resumption, you can then offset any uh, um, un the amount of, uh, of the unscheduled break against any penalty time um, that the player owes as soon as the player informed you. Again, um, I'm not going to go into detail. Um, this is not an exam question uh, uh, or a complex exam question on, on fielder being absent. We, uh, we will go into detail in level two and level three. Earlier, I uh, mentioned about penalty time not disappearing. It gets carried forward into the next day and into the next innings. Remember earlier I mentioned why the laws, uh, the law was uh, was tweaked slightly because players started start to abuse the law. They started to fake uh, injuries. Um, like if a player comes to you saying, umpire, I've got a hamstring injury. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, how do you judge whether, whether the player has a hamstring injury or not? It's not you're not able to uh, to to judge it. In those instances. Um, the player then needs to serve any time that the player was off the field. Um, needs to uh, that uh, needs to serve the same amount of time that the player was off. Needs to be on for that same amount before you see can bowl. But the lawmakers do recognise that there are instances where something happens, and it's actually a, a genuine in, uh, injury. Uh, the lawmakers. This uh, tell us that there are times where penalty time will not be incurred, where a player does not need to serve any penalty time. What are those instances? If a player suffered an external blow during the game and need to leave the field. I'll give you an example of what is uh, seen as the, uh, by the law as an external blow. Let's say a um, uh, field, field is standing at slip, play, uh, batter, uh, cuts at the ball, flies to slip, fielder tries to catch it, it then um, misses it, but then the fielder split, he's uh, webbing. There's a bit of blood, fielder then needs to leave the field. This is an example of an external blow where the ball went against the hand, split the wedding a bit, there's a bit of blood, play and they need to leave the field to get some treatment. Let's say the player was off for 20 minutes from, let's say, 10.30 till 10.50. Now the injured player is back at 10.50. When can that player bowl again? That player can bowl immediately because this is an example of, a, of an external blow where everyone saw it, the umpire saw it, the ball went against the hand, player to leave the field, and no faking here, umpire saw it, no penalty time needs to be incurred. Just another example of an external blow just to emphasize that it doesn't always have to be uh, blood you need to see blood for it to be an external blow. You sometimes find a short leg fielder or let's say silly point fielder, uh, spinner bowling, uh, striker cuts the ball and the ball goes against the uh, the, the sin uh, of or the knee of the short leg fielder. Um, and let's say the short leg fielder wasn't fielding with any, any, any pads on. So now ball goes against the knee. Another example of external blow. If the player needs to leave the field, that time that the player was off, that player does not have to serve any penalty time um, when he or she comes back. That injured fielder can um, bowl immediately. 
Also, penalty time not to be incurred if the player was off the field for a wholly acceptable reason. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of a player needs to inform you or the injured player needs to inform you when he or she returns back after being given uh, treatment. I said to you, the, the first important thing is you need to write down, that's why you need to know when the injured player comes back, because you need to write down the time the injured player comes back, because you need to calculate what penalty time the player owe, uh, owes you. The other important thing, why it's, uh, why it's so important for that injured player to inform you when he or she is returning is because the law is very strict that in, uh, as soon as the injured player returns to the field of play, must inform you. If they did not inform you, and then they do come into contact with the ball while it's in play, there's quite a harsh punishment. And the punishment is as follows. As soon as the player comes into contact, this is now an injured player that received treatment, came back onto the field without informing the umpires. And now while the ball is in play, the injured field that touch the um, now touches the ball. It immediately becomes dead. Five penalty runs to the batting side. Runs completed by by the batters together with the run in progress. If they cross, are also to be scored. Ball not to count as one for the over. Umpires will inform everyone of what just happened, and the umpires will report this to the governing body. So you can see a fairly harsh punishment. Law twenty five speaks about uh, a batter's innings and uh, runners. Yes, the law allows still for runners to, to take place, but there's a playing condition in most competition that, uh, that does not allow for runners, but the law allows for runners because there are uh, uh, many competitions, especially uh, like here in the, in the Western uh, Cape, we do have a, a third division where there's lots of older uh, players playing in the third division and they're not as fit as the younger players, and they, they many times, um, after batting for a few overs, they do need a runner. They do become uh, injured quickly. The law still allows for runners, but we all know these days, in many competitions across the world, um, we actually do not allow a runner anymore. But I just want to emphasize, yes, playing conditions doesn't allow for a runner, but the law still allows uh, for a runner. And point number one, that says only a nominated player may bat or act as a runner. When does a batter's innings commence? When is the two opening bats? Or uh, batter starting of the, after the resumption of play, let's say after uh, a lunch or a, a interruption? That is when the those batter's innings commence. So let's say the innings of the two opening bats, the the um, game starts at 10. As soon as the umpires the calls play, that is when the two the innings of the two, the two opening batters start. But what about the other batters? When do their innings start? Their innings start as soon as that batter first steps onto the field of play. So let's say uh, uh, play starts at 10, opening batters innings start at 10. Five overs later, let's say at 20 past 10, um, one of the opening batters is dismissed. They now leave the field. When does the innings of the number three batter start? It doesn't start when EOC gets to, to the crease and asks for God. No, the law actually tells us as soon as that batter puts foot over the rope or over the boundary, steps onto the field of play, that is when the innings of that particular batter uh, starts. Earlier I mentioned um, there is um, penalty time that a fielder needs to serve before he or she can bowl again. That same uh, law, same principle applies to a, a batter. Uh, sometimes you'll find a batter um, going off um, close to the end of uh, the fielding the, the, um, team's innings. So I'll use an example. Um, it is now three o'clock the afternoon, side um, side A is nine wickets down. The opening bat of side B tells you, I need to leave the field, I've, I've pulled the hamstring. So at three o'clock, the opening bat leaves the, uh, leaves the field. 
10 minutes later, Sada is dismissed. Can the opening bat open the innings? No, the opening bat cannot open the innings because the opening bat first needs to serve 10 minutes penalty time. So the the um, next innings will start at, um, um, let's say, um, innings ended at 15.10. There'll be a 10-minute change of innings. So the new innings will start, offside B will start at 15.20. The opening bat uh, can only bat from 15.30 onwards. So the point I'm trying to make is, batters also need to serve any penalty time that they owe. They need to serve it before they can bat. But there is something in the law that says if a side has lost five wickets, even though it's a, a batter still owes penalty time, that batter can go bat after five wickets are down. Again, in, uh, those of you that's going to join us for level two and three, we're going to go into lots of details when it comes to you know penalty time and uh, examples. In the event of an unscheduled stoppage, if there's a rain interruption, uh, the uh, a batter needs to notif uh, notify the umpire in person. And as soon as the batter notifies the umpire, then from that moment, they can then start offsetting uh, any unscheduled stoppage against any penalty time that the EOC may owe. A batter retiring. A batter may retire at any time during measure innings when the ball come, becomes dead. The umpires needs to be informed of the reason why the batter is re retiring. Why is this important? Because if a batter retires because of either injury, illness, or unavoidable cause, that batter is entitled to resume his or her innings. If they do not resume the innings, that batter will then be recorded in the scorebook as retired, not out. That is if a batter retires because of injury or illness. If a batter retires for any other reason other than injury or illness or of unavoidable cause, for that batter to resume his or her innings, they can only do it with the consent of the opposing captain. If the opposing captain say no, that batter cannot resume his or her innings. And if the innings is not resumed, that batter will then be recorded in the scorebook as retired out. Striker has a right to play the ball. The law say the striker has a right to play the ball or at any time to, to make a legitimate second strike in defense of his or her wicket without interference of the wicketkeeper or of any other fielder. Uh, the law also added, and this is fairly new that was added uh, to the law recently, where the law say the striker when playing at the ball, must have some part of the bat or person, whether grounded or raised, within the pitch. If there's no part of the striker's bat or person remaining within the pitch, and the striker then leaves the pitch, the striker goes totally off the pitch, trying to play at the ball, what must the umpires do? The umpire need to immediately call and signal dead ball. Player batter is not allowed to go totally off the pitch to try to play the ball. As soon as that happens, as soon as that player is off the pitch, umpire immediately call and signal dead ball. Practice on the field. Are you allowed to practice on the match pitch or on the rest of the square? Do you think we are allowed to practice on the match pitch? No, you're not allowed. The law say as soon as that game starts, there shall be no practice at any time on the match pitch. Also, there shall not be any practice on the rest of the square at any time on any day of the match, except if the umpires approve it. So usually at, at most international and provincial grounds, you'll see the square consist of, I know at Newlands, the Newlands uh, cricket ground uh, here in um, Cape Town, South Africa, has about 17, 18 uh, um, strips. It's a fairly huge um, uh, square. Uh, so, and in provincial and test match cricket, 
what usually happens is a playing condition that allows um, polling strips. They'll use uh, right the in strips they usually use. The curator allows for the in strips, like where the the two um, arrows are right at the end of the strips. The playing conditions allow for those bowling strips to be used for players to to warm up. That's the playing condition that allows it. The law actually also allows for uh, for places on the rest of the square to be used with the approval of the umpires. But in terms of the match pits, no, nothing, no practice, nothing to happen on the match pits. Are we allowed to practice on the outfield? Uh, yes, the law allows it. The law tells us before the start of play, you can practice on the outfield. After the close of play, you can practice on the outfield. During lunch and tea intervals or um, change of innings intervals, you are allowed to practice on the outfield. There is a but. If the umpires do feel that, let's say there's been lots of rain around and and um, the the outfield is maybe brittle, um, wet, um, it may be if you allow practice to take place towards a significant deterioration to the condition of the outfield. If that is the case, the umpires do have the power to actually uh, tell the uh, the sides that um, we unfortunately we will not allow any practice on the outfield. So we now have covered you're allowed to practice before play starts, during intervals, during change of innings intervals. But are you allowed to practice while plays in progress. So let's say now test match play starts at 10 o'clock and we know our lunch time is at 12 o'clock. So between 10 and 12, are you allowed to, to practice? The law tell us they are practice permitted, but only fielders as defined in Appendix A to, to participate in such practice. No other ball than the match ball to be used for this practice. You cannot have a, a bowler standing on the boundary bowling practice ball to his or her coach um, um, that's standing outside the boundary. Only the match ball to be used um, if uh, for practice between the call of play and time. No bowling practice to take place in the area between the square and the boundary in a direction parallel to the match pits. The umpires also needs to make sure and they need to be satisfied that if they are practiced between the call of play and time, that this not to contravene either the um, changing the condition of the ball or if the team is trying to waste time. Do we allow a, a bowler trial run up? Yeah, of course we can allow a bowler, bowler trial run up, but the umpires needs to take into account, make sure that the bowler doesn't damage the pitch or the bowler is trying to waste time. Otherwise, we'll allow a bowler a trial run-up. So earlier we spoke about, uh, you know, the timings, when you're allowed to practice. So what are, what, do you, what happens if either members of the fielding side contravene this or members of the batting side can also contravene? The law tells us that, firstly, if there is a contravention, warn the player that this practice is not permitted, Inform your colleague and as soon as possible, inform both captains. If the contravention is by a batter, the umpire then to inform the other batter and each incoming batter of this warning. And this warning is a team warning and apply throughout to apply throughout the match. So you first give them a warning if they, if they did practice and if they did contravene it. So now after the warning, they do it again. What do you do? Five penalty runs to the opposing side. You'll inform everyone and you report this to the governing body. The last law that I'm covering for this evening is the wicketkeeper. When it comes to protective equipment, the law allows the wicketkeeper to wear protective equipment and the law tells us that when it comes to protective equipment for the wicketkeeper, the wicketkeeper is the only fielder to wear gloves and external leg guards. So keeper can wear gloves and keeper can have the, the keeping pads outside his or her trousers. 
you've probably seen uh, um, the short leg fielders um, when they do have uh, pads on, but the but the pad is inside the trousers because the law only allows the keeper to wear external leg guards outside the trousers. All other fielders, if they do want to put on uh, um, sin guards or, 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 or um, leg guards, they need to put it underneath the trou trou trousers. And then the law allows... So a keeper can wear gloves and external leg guards, and the keeper can then use these gloves and external leg guards to feel the ball. Also, if you see as umpires by the wicket keeper's actions and positioning that it is apparent that the Keepers not able to carry out the normal duties, duties of a wicketkeeper. That keeper shall then forfeit his or her right to be recognized as a keeper in terms of a fair catch, stumping, the gloves, limitation of on onside fielders, and fielders to encroach on the pitch. So what that means is, and I'll use an example, let's say you see the keeper, uh, um, a, a medium pace bowler is bowling, and the keeper standing on the boundary. The keeper standing behind the stumps, but the keeper standing on the boundary. What do you do? The law tells us that because of the positioning of that keeper, that keeper is not seen as a wicked keeper anymore. So now, that keeper, because that keeper is not uh, seen as a key, as a wicked keeper anymore, that keeper, that person is not allowed to use gloves or external pads to be to feel or catch the ball. So we're not saying a fielder cannot stand um, uh, on the boundary behind behind the stumps, but you will then tell that fielder you now not recognize as a keeper anymore. You now need to remove those gloves and those external uh, pads. If you're going to keep them on and if you're going to make contact with the ball, we're, um, we're going to get to illegal fielding and the punishment of it, but that's going to be an example of illegal fielding. And there's a fairly harsh punishment um, for illegal fielding. These are just example of gloves where the law allows for no webbing between fingers. There to be a single piece of non-stress material between the index finger and the thumb. And this is solely for means of, of uh, support. So you can see that um, um, between the, the thumb and the uh, index finger, that just to be the um, by uh, means of support and uh, and it's n it to be non stretch you usually about 20 years ago um this used to be a huge used to look like a a, a baseball a baseball glove it used to be huge uh, this this pouch but the uh, lawmakers outlawed it it's not allowed only a non uh, piece of non stretch material to be allowed so where does the keeper stand? What does the law say? What is the position of the wicked keeper? The law wants the keeper to remain at all times or only behind the wicket at the striker's end from the moment the ball comes into play until a ball is delivered by the bowler. So as soon as the ball comes into play, as soon as the bowler takes his or her first step, that's when it comes into play, the wicked keeper to remain behind the stumps. The keeper can then only come in front of the stumps if it either touches the battle person of the striker or if it passes the strikers, uh, the wicket at the strikers in or if the striker attempts a run. We'll, have, we'll see a video in a slide of two uh, time uh, where it will illustrate um, this law perfectly. If a wicket keeper do contravene this law, the strikers and umpire because he or she is in the best position to make the score, to call and signal no ball. Here is that video that I just spoke about. Let's listen to it. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. First, let's watch a footage from the T20 match between India and Australia, which happened on 21st of November 2018. Australian wicketkeeper Alex Carey ends up touching the stumps before the ball reaches him. 
and after referring to the third umpire it was declared a no ball so what do you guys think about it it's a no ball because he touched the stumps well let's find out before going any further let us take a look at the restrictions a wicket keeper has he has restrictions both on his movement and position according to cricket law after the ball comes into play well to know when the ball comes into play watch the above video and before the ball reaches the striker it is unfair if the wicket keeper makes any significant movement in this case umpire will call it dead ball and further action will be invalid however he is allowed to make certain movements let's take a look at them he is allowed to move a few steps forward for a slower delivery but doing so should not bring the stumps in his reach he is allowed to move laterally like this wicket keeper in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered he is allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing like this wicket keeper does but he has to make sure that he follows the law 27.3.1 let's see what exactly that law is the wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket he can't even be parallel to the stumps from the moment the ball comes into play till either of the following things happens ball touches the bat or body of the striker so he can come ahead of the stumps right after the ball touches the bat or batsman's body just like this keeper does next case he can come ahead after the ball passes the stumps and he can come ahead if the striker starts running without playing the shot it will be called a no ball in case of keeper violating this law in the case of alex carry ball had touched the bat when he broke the wicket hence this is not a violation of law but he was parallel to the stumps before the ball made contact with the bat hence it was called a no ball another instance which needs a mention here is andy flars incident he is clearly ahead of the stumps even before the ball reached the batsman it should have been called a no ball but the umpire didn't notice it at all and unfortunately it costed ridley jacobs his wicket still have any doubts with this do let me know in the comment section if you like the video hit the like button share with all your friends to never miss another update from our channel don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification button just to emphasize uh, what the, the narrator just said he spoke about movement by the keeper so the law tells us after the ball comes into play and before it reaches the striker it is unfair for the keeper to significantly alter his or her position in relation to the striker's wicket except for the following few movement a few paces forward for slower delivery and less that a few paces forward brought the keeper within the reach of the wicket lateral movement in response to the direction of the ball that is allowed and lastly keepers allowed movement in response to the stroke that the striker is playing i'm just emphasizing that the the um the video just showed us um exact footage of how this law works so now law tell us and what the video didn't tell us if there was unfair movement by the keeper what punishment is there so either umpire to call and signal dead ball and inform the other umpire for the reason Policy in a bar, then if there was an oval or white, or that's how always stand, five penalty runs to the batting side. You'll inform the captain of the fielding side for the reason for this action. You'll inform batters and batting captain when possible, and to report this to the governing body. This is just another example where Timber Bavuma was playing a paddle sweep. As soon as the timber showed intent to to paddle, the keeper and the slips is allowed to move. In terms of interference with the wicket keeper by the striker, the law tells us in playing at the ball or in legitimate defence of the striker's uh, wicket, the striker interferes with the keeper. The striker shall be not up. The keeper, the striker is allowed to protect his or her wicket. There's one exception. The striker is not allowed to obstruct a ball from being caught. If that happens, the striker uh, can be given out obstructing the field, and we'll get to um, law 
tomorrow evening. Tom, thank you so much. That is my portion for the evening. I'm now handing over to you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. Good evening to you and the candidates. I will be taking us through laws 28, 29, 30 and 31 this evening, after which time we shall go to our questions and answer sessions. So Abdullah has dealt with the wicket keeper. Law 28 is the fielder, and you'll see a few similarities between what the fielder and the wicket keepers are allowed to do in terms of movement. First question though is differentiating the wicket keeper to the fielder. And I want you to all write an answer in the chat box before the end of this video. So the question to all of you is as follows. Is a normal fielder allowed to use wicket keeper equipment? Is a normal fielder allowed to use wicket keeper equipment, uh, specifically the gloves? So please put your answers in the chat box and we will get an answer to that question through this video. But before I play the video, I'd like you all to give the question a go. And please don't be shy. Don't be worried about getting the question wrong. This is a safe space for you to learn. Let's have a look at this video and it will answer our question. Right, the first delivery, there's five penalty runs, and that's because of illegal fielding because Barbar Azam picked up Rizwan's glove and used it to catch the ball. To catch the so there's your answer, ladies and gentlemen. A normal fielder is not allowed to use wicket keepers' equipment if they do so, as Barbar Azam did in that scenario then the ball becomes automatically dead, but it is good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball because as we can see, not a lot of players know this law and then signal five penalty runs to the batting side for illegal fielding. So the fact that an international captain doesn't know this law tells you that we as umpires need to know our laws so that we can correctly adjudicate on such scenarios and also educate the players on such scenarios. So let's just define illegal fielding. The law tells us that a fielder may field the ball with any part of his or her person. However, he or she will be deemed to have fielded the ball illegally while the ball is in play if he or she willfully does the following things. One, uses anything other than part of his or her person to field the ball. Two, extends his or her clothing and uses this to field the ball. And we do have a picture of that. Three, discards a piece of clothing, equipment, or any other object which subsequently makes contact with the ball. So let me give you an example of scenario three. Quite often when players are chasing after a delivery, they 
maybe feel like they would run faster if their cap is off. So they take their cap off and continue running. If after fielding the ball, they throw the ball towards the wicketkeeper or the bowler and the ball hits the cap that has been intentionally removed or discarded by the fielder, then that shall be deemed illegal fielding as per point number three. It's important though that it needs to be a willful act by the fielder. If while running the cap flies off because of the speed at which the fielder is running, it is not intentionally discarded. So it has come off the head of the fielder by uh, accident. And then if the throw hits that accidentally fallen cap, then it will not be regarded as illegal fielding. The ball will stay live and play will continue. OK, so you need to, as an umpire, always know if a cap has come off a fielder's head. How did it come off? Was it discarded intentionally by the fielder or did it fly off because of the wind blowing uh, or the speed at which the fielder was chasing the ball? There, as mentioned, it is not illegal fielding if the ball in play makes contact with a piece of clothing, equipment, or any other object which has accidentally fallen from the fielder's person. It could well happen with a towel tucked into the back of uh, a player's uh, pants or waist. There are there is the picture of a player using his cap illegally to field the ball. You cannot use the cap other than it being on the player's head. If a fielder illegally fields the ball, the ball shall immediately become dead. The penalty for noble or wide, as always, will stand. And any runs completed by the batters shall be credited to the batting side, together with the run in progress, if the batters had already crossed at the instant of the offence. OK. Quite importantly, the ball shall not count as one of the legal deliveries in the over. And what else do we as umpires need to do? We need to award five penalty runs to the batting side and we need to inform and report accordingly. We've all seen that when a spinner is bowling from uh, one end and a fast bowler is bowling from the other end, quite often when the spinner is bowling, you have close fielders and those close fielders will because of safety measures have to wear protective helmets then if they are not close fielders while the fast bowler is bowling then the helmet will come off and the wicket keeper will place the discarded helmet behind the wicket keeper and what happens if the ball goes through the wicket keeper's legs and hits that protective helmet law tells us that if a protective helmet belonging to the fielding side is on the ground and the ball while in place strikes it the ball shall become immediately dead but again it's good umpiring practice here to call and signal no ball. Most players do know this law. However, most players on the field won't see the ball hitting the helmet behind the wicket keeper. So either of the two umpires, whoever sees the ball hitting the helmet first, call and signal dead ball 
to make everyone aware on the field that the ball has hit the helmet behind the wicket keeper. Next, we shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. And any runs completed by the batters before the ball strikes the protective helmet shall be scored. Together with the run in progress, if the batters had already crossed at the instant of the ball striking the helmet. You'll notice here that we don't have to uh, report this particular incident. Abdullah spoke about illegal movement of the wicketkeeper. Let's have a look at what law allows and disallows for movement by fielders. Any movement by any fielder, excluding the wicketkeeper, after the ball comes into play and before the ball reaches the striker, is unfair except minor adjustments to stance or position in, related to, in relation to the striker's wicket. All of us who have played cricket, especially at a young age, we're always told to walk in with the bowler. And this minor adjustment is exactly what is allowed in terms of walking in with the bowler. Uh, quite importantly, it needs to be walking towards the striker's wicket and not walking backwards. Some fielders do sometimes walk backwards. And that is actually, if spotted by the umpire, is punishable for illegal movement. What else is allowed? The law tells us that movement by any fielder other than a close fielder towards the striker or the striker's wicket that does not significantly alter the position of the fielder. Um, so this actually is the walking in with the bowler. Movement by any fielder in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his action suggests he intends to play is also allowed as long as it is not in front of the striker because that movement will distract the striker. So earlier, Abdullah showed us a picture of the wicketkeeper seeing Temba Bavuma play a lap sweep shot. The wicketkeeper moved from his normal position, which is directly behind the stumps, down leg side, anticipated where the ball would be hit and actually took a great catch. The same way that a wicketkeeper is allowed to do that, the fielders behind the wicket, like a first slip or a second slip, are also allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or shaping to play. So what do we do as umpires if we spot illegal or unfair movement by a fielder? Law tells us that either umpire shall call and signal dead ball and inform the other umpire of the reason. Then the bowler's end umpire shall award the one run penalty for a wide or a no ball. This is always the case if there was a wide or no ball. Of course, we, because of the illegal building, need to award five penalty runs and we need to inform and report the incident to the relevant parties. So that is law 28, the fielder. Now we move on to law 29, the wicket is down. Let's watch an animation video from the Laws of Cricket Library. And for those of you who don't know where to find these Laws of Cricket animation videos, they are on YouTube. You can just type in the Laws of Cricket and they should be the first to come up. Uh, they are also on the Laws of Cricket mobile app. 
you can download them on uh, Google Store, Google Play Store, or the Apple Store. The links to those stores are on the bottom of all of my emails. Let's see what the animation video has got to teach us on Law 29, The Wicket is Down. The wicket is down. The wicket is put down when one or both bales are removed from the top of the stumps or a stump is struck out of the ground. The situation can be brought about in the following ways. By the ball, by the batsman's bat, by the batsman's bat if he or she lets go of it, or even by some flying part of a bat if it breaks, by the batsman's clothing or body or some part of his or her equipment falling off, by a fielder with his or her hand or arm, providing the same hand is holding the ball. If the bale merely bounces and comes to rest back on the stumps, then that is not out. The wicket is down at the precise moment that both ends of either bale are removed from the stumps. Right about now. Should you have further questions on this tricky subject, such as how to put the wicket down when one or both bales have already been removed, head over to Law 29 in MCC's The Laws of Cricket. So we've learned how and when the wicket is fairly put down. I'm going to put you to the test by two scenarios. The first one is a video. The second one is a picture. So in this video, I'm sure a lot of you will have seen it, quite a popular law video that has been going around for a few years now. Question is, is the wicket down in this delivery? Please put the answer in the chat box. Yes or no, is the wicket down? Uh, maybe just to have different answers from the previous um, question, write either bold or not out. Bold or not out, here we go. Good appeal from deep cover from Tricky. Well, amazing. Uh, fail. So there we go. Out or not out. Bold or not out. That is your question to type the answer into the chat box. I'm not going to play the rest of the video because it reveals the answer. We will chat through the answer just before our question and answer session. Very rare scenario, but it has happened, so we need to know how to deal with it if it ever happens in one of our matches. Next scenario for you. Again, let's assume a bowler bowled a delivery and it hit the stumps. And this is how the stumps and the bales ended up. Has the wicket been fairly put down? Maybe here we can answer removal or not removal. So removal means yes, the batter is out. Not removed means no, the batter is not out. Removal or no removal? Interesting one. Right. This picture depicts if the wicket has previously been put down. Say, for example, a bowler bowled the ball. And as he was about to release his delivery, his um, hand flicked the stumps on the non-striker's end and both bales dropped to the ground. A batter hit the ball into the covers. They ran for a single. And so to attempt to 
run the batter out. This is how the bowler needs to remove the, this is how the bowler needs to put the wicket down fairly for a second time. He needs to remove either any of the three stumps with ball in hand and touching the stump, okay? As depicted clearly in this picture. We will see in the next picture that here, the ball is not touching the stump. So this is incorrect and the wicket is not fairly put down as per this picture. What happens if there was a gust of wind while the ball was in play? This again is at the bowler's end, so we would have carried on. We would not call and signal dead ball. We only need to call and signal dead ball if the wind blows off the striker's bales. So the non-striker's bales, one bale has been blown off while the ball was in play. Now the question is, how do we remove or put the wicket down fairly for a second time? Law tells us here that we can merely remove the other bale, okay? So in this picture, you see there is one bale missing. Let's assume that it was blown by the wind uh, off the top of uh, those two stumps. And now Law tells us, to put the wicket down fairly for a second time in the same delivery, you can simply remove the other bell. Okay, no need to uproot the stump and while holding it with the ball in hand. Next, we move on to law 30. When is the batter out of his or her ground? Once again, we've got a Laws of Cricket animation for this law. Let's have a look at what Tommy has to tell us. Batsman out of his or her ground. When a batsman is out of his or her ground, he or she risks being stumped or run out. So when is a batsman out of his or her ground? According to Law 30, a batsman should be considered to be out of his or her ground unless the bat he or she is holding or some part of the batsman's person is grounded behind the popping crease at that end. Here, for example, the bat is on the crease marking but not behind it, which means the batsman is most definitely out. But would the batsman be out now? Both the bat and the batsman are over the line, but neither the bat nor any part of the batsman's person is grounded, i.e. in contact with the ground. So, yes, that's out again. This being cricket, there is an exception to this part of the law. If a batsman, who must be running or diving, has already made his or her ground, either with the bat or any part of the body, but subsequently loses contact with the ground while continuing his or her forward momentum as the wicket is put down, he or she will be not out. Next question, and this can be a bit of a headache, what constitutes each batsman's ground? Well, when one batsman is in a ground, i.e. grounded behind a popping crease, then the ground at the other end belongs to the other batsman. If neither is in his or her ground, for example, when they are both running between wickets or even stationary, each ground belongs to the batsman who is nearest to it. If both batsmen are level, then where they were before drawing level is the deciding factor. Of course, this being cricket, there are further delightful complications, such as two batsmen in the same ground, or three when you have a striker with a runner. 
But never fear, all mental anguish will clear with a little quiet meditation and reference to Law 30 in the Blue Book. Just a reminder that the Blue Book is only made available to members of umpires association around the country and around the world. Uh, it is not for sale anywhere as far as I know, uh, but the PDF document uh, for the latest Laws of Cricket, the 2022 version, is also downloadable on the bottom of the emails that are sent out regularly. Where does the non-striker stand when a bowler is bowling? Last week, Abdullah taught us about right arm over the wicket and right arm round the wicket, left arm over the wicket and left arm round the wicket. Whichever side the bowler is bowling, the non-striker should stand on the other side of the stumps unless a request to do otherwise is grounded, granted by the umpire. Sometimes you find that you are playing on the fast strip of the square. So if a batter is standing on the end that the square ends, he or she will be standing on the outfield and some outfields are quite heavy and it's difficult for that non-striker to run along the outfield. They prefer to run on the square. Uh, so then maybe he or she will ask the bowler and the umpire if he or she can stand on the same side that the bowler is bowling. But of course, a fair bit wider of the bowler so that the non-striker is not in the bowler's way or obstructing the striker's view. Last question for from me, but I am giving you the answer on this one. We can see here that the striker is outside of his crease. However, his bat is in his crease. The bat is not held in either hand or glove. The bat is leaning on his hamstring. And the wicket is fairly put down by the wicket keeper. So question to all of you. You can just uh, say it out loud in your house. Is this better out or not out? The answer is out. The bat needs to be held in a hand for it to be considered part of the better. So hold the bat in the hand and ground the bat beyond the pop increase and then you will be considered safe in this scenario because he's not holding the bat in his hand he is considered outside of his crease therefore out last law for this evening and on tuesday our next lecture is tomorrow we will go through laws 32 to 40 which are the modes of dismissals but before we get into the modes of dismissals tomorrow, we need to learn about what happens before a mode of dismissal. Well, of course, the fielding side have to appeal. Let's see what the law has to tell us about appeals. The law tells us that an umpire is not to give a batter out without an appeal. Of course, you'll all ask me, what about when a batter is out bold? The law is quite clear on this. Neither umpire shall give a batter out, even though he or she may be out under the laws unless appealed to by a fielder. 
This, however, shall not debar a batter who is out under any of the laws from leaving the wicket without an appeal having been made. So a lot of the time when a batter is out bold, the fielding team just celebrates. They don't appeal. Uh, but the batter is out and the batter usually leaves the crease and walks off the field because he or she knows that they are out. So no appeal is required because the batter has left the building. Note, however, that an umpire shall intervene if satisfied that a batter not having been given out has left the wicket under the misapprehension of being out. The umpire intervening shall call and signal dead ball to prevent any further action by the fielding side and shall recall the batter. So I've seen this happen and I've looked for the video, but I can't find it where a uh, batter uh, edges a delivery and it goes to first slip and first slip appears to take a clean catch and the batter leaves his crease thinking that he is out caught but without having full control of his body or the ball or both the fielder dropped the ball so not out in terms of the court law which we shall deal with tomorrow and then the second slip seeing that the batter had left his crease under the misapprehension that they were out collected the ball and threw the stumps down with the batter out of his crease so law protects the batter in that type of scenario and says that an umpire seeing that the batter has left his or her crease under the misapprehension that they are out Please, as soon as you see this, ladies and gents, call and signal dead ball so that the fielding side does not attempt to run out the batter who is not actually out. Okay. A batter may be recalled at any time up to the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery unless it is the final wicket of the innings, in which case it should be up to the instant when the umpires leave the field for the change of innings. How long is an appeal valid? Law tells us that for an appeal to be valid, it must be made before the bowler begins his or her run-up or in the absence of a run-up before the bowler enters his or her bowling action for the next delivery. When does the bowling action start, you ask? It is when the back foot lands. And of course, the appeal needs to be made before the call of time. Interestingly, the call of over does not invalidate an appeal made prior to the start of the following over, provided that time has not been called. These two sentences are in green, so there will be a question in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 online umpiring exam about the timing of appeals. How does a fielder or any player appeal. The full word is, how was that? And quite importantly, it covers all modes of dismissals. So when a fielder appeals or a bowler appeals, you as an umpire do not have to ask 
what are you appealing for? You must consider all modes of dismissals in your decision whether the batter is out or not out. And I'm sure you all know that players use a variety of ways to say how was that. So don't be too pedantic about how they pronounce their appeal as long as it sounds something like how's that? Who answers which appeals? The law tells us that the strikers and umpire shall answer all appeals arising out of hit wicket, stumped, and run out when it occurs at the wicketkeeper's end. The bowler's end umpire shall answer all other appeals. Okay, quite important there, the jurisdiction of each umpire is clearly spelt out by the law. When an appeal is made, each umpire shall answer only on the matter that falls within his or her jurisdiction. We have mentioned in the first lecture when you can consult with your partner, um, but please, those modes of dismissals where we haven't mentioned that you can consult with your partner, do not consult, for example, for an LBW appeal. When a batter has been given not out, either umpire may answer an appeal if it is on a further matter and is within his or her jurisdiction. I'll give you an example to illustrate this point. I was umpiring about three weeks ago a club cricket match between Cape Town Cricket Club and Belleville Cricket Club. Belleville was bowling and um, spin bowler. The bowler bowled the ball and there was a huge appeal for court behind a nick. Um, and as the wicketkeeper collected the ball, caught the ball, he did not throw the ball up in the air to celebrate. He broke the stumps to try and affect a run out and also appealed to me as the strikers end umpire for a stumping. Sorry, not a run out, a stumping. So there was an appeal to the bowler's end umpire for court behind and there was an appeal to me at striker's end for a stumping. Um, my stumping was quite tight. I, I didn't give it out, um, but my partner gave out the appeal for court and we will learn uh, in tomorrow's lecture as to which dismissals take precedence over which other dismissals. A word on consultation by umpires. Each umpire shall answer appeals on matters within his or her own jurisdiction. If an umpire is doubtful about any point that the other umpire may have been in a better position to see, he or she shall consult the latter on this point of fact and shall then give the decision. We've mentioned, for example, that sometimes when a batter nicks the ball and it goes to first or second slip, the bowler's end umpire's view of the catch being taken by the slip fielder might be obstructed by the bowler in his or her follow through. And so the bowler's end umpire not seeing the catch being taken would need to consult with his or her partner at striker's end who would have a better view from side on as to whether the ball carried or not and was cleanly caught by the slip fielder. In our practical from two Wednesdays ago, which is on our YouTube channel, 
we discussed which decisions you can consult and which you shouldn't consult. So please have a look at that video uh, for you to be able to learn when to consult and when not to consult with your partner. If after consultation there is still doubt remaining, the decision shall always be not out. Simple rule of umpiring, if in doubt, not out. Can a fielding team withdraw an appeal? Let's see what the law says. The law tells us that the captain of the fielding side may withdraw an appeal only after obtaining the consent of the umpire within whose jurisdiction the appeal falls. If such consent is given, the umpire concerned shall, if applicable, revoke the decision and recall the batter. Now, why would a fielding captain withdraw an appeal? It uh, deals a lot with the spirit of cricket, which we covered in our first lecture. The controversial appeals like obstructing the field or a running out of the non-striker by the bowler, often referred to as a man cad. And we've seen a controversial timed out appeal at the recently com completed Cricket World Cup 50 over tournament. Those types of appeals, it is good umpiring practice to consult with your partner before making a decision. And we encourage club cricket umpires, when you are coming together with your partner, spot where the captain is in the field and ask him or her in passing, captain, do you want to go ahead with this appeal or would you consider withdrawing it? This is our attempt to encourage the captain to play the game within the spirit of the game, but we cannot force the captain to withdraw the appeal, however controversial it might seem. If the captain does not withdraw the appeal, then we need to adjudicate on the appeal based on the law that the appeal is for. Okay. The withdrawal of an appeal must be before the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery or if the innings has been completed, the instant when the umpires leave the field. To finish off tonight's presentation, let's watch a video of a famous withdrawal of an appeal after a very controversial dismissal. Putting on 162 for the third wicket. Then in the final ball of the session, incredible controversy. Owen Morgan thought he'd scored four here after some clumsy fielding by Pravan Kumar. And the batsman began walking off the tee. Replay showed, though, the ball never actually touched the rope. So when the bales came off, with Morgan and Bell on their way back to the pavilion, India appealed, perhaps unsportingly, for the unlikeliest run-out you will ever see. And the letter of the law said Bell had to go. A dramatic and savoury end, it seemed, to a brilliant innings of 137. Bell bemused, the crowd furious, but England 254 for four. Where the second session had ended in booze and acrimony, and the England batsman walked back onto the field after tea. It was to astonish stares and then huge cheers to see Ian Bell amongst them. During the interval, Indian captain MS Dhoni had sportingly withdrawn their successful appeal over Bell's controversial run-out. Big call in every sense. The spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. 
putting on a the spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. That's what we love to hear as cricket fans. Uh, what's interesting there is that remember we said that an appeal must be withdrawn when the must be before the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery or if the innings has been completed the instant when the umpires leave the field. So an innings wasn't completed, but the umpires had left the field for T. So you could say that technically they should not have allowed the withdrawal of the appeal, but as brilliantly worded by the commentator, the spirit of the game superseded uh, the letter of the law. So that is all we have for you this evening in terms of uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we shall now go into the chat box to see your answers for all of my quiz questions. And then we can also go through any of the questions that you might have while we were presenting. So. Going to the uh, top of the chat box, I can see Nitin was answering a few penalty time questions posed by Abdullah or calculations that Abdullah was doing. Well done, uh, Nitin and Salim. Uh, Isaac asks, Sorry, Isaac, before we get to your question, I'm going to go through the answers to our quiz questions. So the first question I asked all of you, is a normal fielder allowed to use wicket keeper equipment? And before I showed you the video of Baba Azam using uh, Rizwan's glove, you all answered in Emphatically, no, not allowed. Only the wicket keeper is allowed to do so. Well done to all of you that answered that question. Uh, Shah Murad Qureshi, I'll come to your question after going through your quiz, all of your quiz answers. Next question I asked based on that uh, video where the bowler Ball the ball and it hit the stumps. The bell jumped out of its groove, but then landed in the groove of the off stump. Uh, very interesting scenario. Question is, is the wicket down in the bold scenario? Is the batter bold or not out? And you all have gone with not out except Luto thought it was bold, as well as Tawanda. Uh, ladies and gents, the law tells us that the bales need, either one of the bales need to be completely removed from the top of the stumps. So in that scenario, that bale, although it wasn't in its normal position on top of middle stump and off stump, uh, it was still on top of a stump so the lucky old batsman was not out because the bale had not fallen off from the top of the stump okay then a few moments later i showed you a picture where a bale was stuck three quarters of the way up between two stumps. And the question here is, is there fair and complete removal of the bale? And some mixed answers here, I think. It says removal, not removal. Removal, removal, not removal, no removal. So a few no's and a few yes removals. 
So I'm going to go back to that definition from the uh, bold scenario. The bail, either one of the bales needs to be completely removed from the top of the stumps. And if you go back to that picture on the presentation, that bale was completely removed from the top of the stumps. So yes, that was the wicket being put down by the removal of a bale. Okay, doesn't have to fall to the ground as long as it is off the top of the stumps. I think that one uh, had a few people confused. Okay, those were the three questions I asked you. Thank you for your participation in answering, and I hope you all learnt a lot from those scenarios. So going back up the chat box to questions that have been raised. Abdullah, I'm going to uh, give this first one to you from Isaac. What happens when the wicket keeper standing back begins to move forward as the bowler is in his or her run up? Is that allowed or is that illegal movement by the wicket keeper? Um, Isaac, the law allows the keeper to move a few paces forward for a slower delivery unless that few paces forward brings the keeper within reach of the stumps. If that is the case, the umpire to call and signal dead ball. So that's the that's the first scenario that I'm covering, where the law tell us for a slower delivery, yes, the keeper can actually move a pace or two forward unless it brings him or her within the reach of the stumps. If it brings him or her within the reach, that shouldn't be allowed. I'm proud to then call and signal um, a dead ball. <clears throat> yeah. Secondly, you often find a keeper uh, as soon as the bowler starts, he's or a run up, the keeper then gets into a gather position uh, by crouching, taking a step or two forward. Uh, that is also no, no issue. Keep a getting into his or her gather, crouching now, taking a step or two forward. No issue with that. It is now your judgment call by looking at the movement of the keeper. Did the keeper, was it, was it moving forward for just to get in position for a gather or did the keeper move one or two paces forward for, um, for a so slower delivery. If not, if the keeper is really moving forward, let's say standing 20 meters back, and then now suddenly you see the keeper standing now 10 meters back while the bowl is running in. That is definitely a significant forward movement. That should not uh, be allowed, and you need to then intervene um, immediately. So in those two instances, like I mentioned, if it was for slower delivery, the law actually allows for a few, uh, one or two paces forward, or keep a getting uh, ready to gather in a crouch position, also then moving one or two paces forward. Uh, no issue with that. But is there a significant movement by the keeper? That is where we as an umpires needs to uh, intervene. You need to uh, make uh, that judgment call. Um, depending on each situation. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question is from Shah. Uh, quite a good one. I'm going to just simplify it a little bit because it's quite long-winded the way that he has uh, written it. Uh, essentially, a injured player is off the field, given permission by the umpires to leave the field. The injured player returns to the field, but the strikers and umpire had not given permission to the player to return to the field. And the player completes a catch, and then the strikers and umpire calls and signals dead ball and awards five penalty runs. But then the fielding captain and that fielder go to the 
bowlers end umpire and say, but bowlers end umpire, we told you and you gave that fielder permission to come back onto the field. So now, why did your partner call and signal dead ball and award five penalty runs? Uh, Abdullah, take us through the communication that needs to happen between the two umpires when they receive, one of them receives news from a player, uh, please. <clears throat> Uh, yes, Tom, uh, I'll take it a step back just to practically um, explain to uh, to everyone uh, the importance of this and uh, because the uh, the penalty time comes in here when the injured fielder returns, also this law of a player returning without permission also comes into effect. I did mention it earlier, but I'll just quickly uh, recap. So when a player comes to you saying he or she is injured, you need to write down the time that the player is leaving and the um, time, um, name of the player and the reason why the player uh, is leaving. You then tell the injured player, when you come back, please inform either of the two umpires. You also uh, relay that message to the fielding captain to inform you when that player is coming back. Also, if the player informed you, you in turn need to inform your colleague that the uh, player is going off reason and you, the two umpires double check the time. Let's say 10.30, both umpires have exactly the same time. So now the injured fielder now comes back. So you've mentioned it to the fielding captain as well as to the injured player. So everyone is well aware what needs to be done. So now the injured player comes back. So the law tell us, Injured player only needs to inform one of the umpires. And then that umpire that was informed to in turn inform his or her colleague. So the procedure is fielder only informs one of the umpires, the other umpire to inform his or her colleague. Because what then now needs to happen Let's say the umpire informs uh, me. I will then relay that message. Tom, uh, Mary is back on, on the field um, of play. And it is now 10.50. Because the two of us uh, needs to uh, confirm the amount of time that um, Mary was off. Because the, we need to relay when Mary can bowl again to her as well as to um, uh, her captain. So again, just to summarize. Penalty time portion needs to be handled. And also, importantly, the whoever umpire received the information that the um, uh, injured fielder now returned to the field, that message must be relayed to your colleague as soon as you receive um, the message. Did I answer your question, Tom? Yeah, you answered my question. So now I'm going to answer Shah's question. Um, so we've made the mistake as umpires. We haven't communicated with each other. Um, so I uh, call and signal dead ball because I think this fielder is back on the field without permission. And I s signal uh, five penalty runs to the batting side. Uh, then the fielders go complain to um, Abdullah. Abdullah, I told you that I was coming back on. What happened? So in that scenario, Shah, uh, we would have to cancel those five penalty runs and that batter would definitely be out court um, because the fielder had informed one of the umpires that they were back on the field. So not illegal fielding and the uh, the batter, sorry, the fielder did have permission to be back on the field. Okay, uh, but let's be proactive as Abdullah has mentioned, let's communicate and make sure that we don't never make that mistake, please, Shah. Okay, um, carrying on down the chat box. 
Uh, Shah asks a question that I answered while uh, I was uh, presenting. I think he probably typed in the question before I gave my example. If a player's cap or glasses accidentally drop while fielding the ball and the ball touches the cap or glasses, will it be illegal fielding? No, Shah. You've used the word they accidentally dropped. If uh, any piece of clothing or equipment is accidentally um, removed from the person of the fielder and the ball comes into contact with that piece of clothing or equipment, uh, it will not be illegal fielding because it got there accidentally. Okay, if it was discarded, Willfully by a fielder, then yes, as per my example, where the fielder threw off the cap to try and run faster, um, then definitely if the ball touches that cap which has been willfully discarded, then it will be considered illegal fielding. Okay. Um, Isaac asks, can an appeal be withdrawn when the fielding team's appeals for leg before wicket and the umpire gives it out? Then the captain withdraws the leg before wicket appeal. Abdullah, I've never ever seen that in my 30 years of watching cricket. Uh, have you ever seen a LBW appeal being withdrawn? Is it allowed to be withdrawn? No, Tom, I have never, ever, and also my, all my uh, years of um, umpiring and also watching cricket, I haven't seen an LBW appeal being withdrawn. Uh, but the law actually allows for it. Mm. The, law, the law allows for an appeal to be withdrawn. So it doesn't specify that it can only be whether it's a run out or stumping or catch or whatever. It covers all mode of dismissal. So if there's an appeal and if it's a mode of dismissal, the law allows for it. So if the captain of the fielding side wants to withdraw the appeal, uh, you see needs to go to uh, the, the umpire that made the decision, which is the bolus in umpire, uh, relay that message to the bolus in umpire. And if the bolus in umpire is, is, is happy to accept the, the withdrawing of the appeal, no problem. Um, the, uh, the, um, the outbatter can then resume his or her innings. Over Tom. Thanks, uh, Dula. Uh, next question is from Tony. Tony asks, please give me the calls to be made by the strikers and umpire. So law tells us that the laws and the dismissals that are within the jurisdiction of the strikers and umpire are three, law 35, hit wicket, law 39, stumped, and law 38, run out at the wicket keeper's end. So only those three appeals should be answered by the strikers and umpire. Appeals for hit wicket, stumped, and run out when the appeal or the wicket is put down at the wicket keeper's end. All other appeals are for the bowler's end umpire to answer. Next question is another one from Isaac. Isaac is uh, getting nervous before the exam maybe, or very excited by today's lecture. Uh, Abdullah, can a fielding player who was injured in the first innings towards the end of that innings when they were fielding, come into bat as an opening batter in the second innings, even though he did not serve penalty time. I think you did mention penalty time does go over into the next innings. Please explain 
please maybe give us an example, Abdullah, of a fielder going off before their batting innings starts. Isaac, to, uh, to firstly answer your question, and uh, no, the opening bat cannot bat. And I'll, I'll give you now a uh, reason what the law say, and I'll use an example to illustrate what the law is trying to say. So the law say that an injured fielder, before he or she is allowed to bowl or bat, needs to serve the penalty time that he or she um, owes. Law slightly different when it comes to a fielder and um, when it comes to a batter. Your question is about the batter. So let me use an example to illustrate what the law uh, is saying with regards to a, a batter. Let's say uh, side A is um, eight wickets down and at three o'clock the opening bat um, the opening bat that's now a field that's a field but is the opening bat of side B uh, comes to you and inform you that I've injured my hamstring I need to leave the field so you will allow the um, injured fielder who's the opening bat of side B to leave the field will write down the name time that the EOC is leave, uh, leaving and the reason for the injury so it's three o'clock injured batter John leaving the field hamstring. So remember, side A is eight wickets down, and John uh, was currently field, uh, fielding for side A, but he's the opening bat of the other side, other team. So eight wickets down, um, the 10th wicket falls at four o'clock. So now at the end of the innings, you need to calculate the penalty time that any fielder still owes. And at the end of the innings, John was off the field. So John owes, at the end of the innings, 60 minutes of penalty time. So at four o'clock when the innings ended, John owes 60 minutes of penalty time. So important uh, um, duty of the umpires is firstly to calculate that penalty time and then to inform the uh, opposing or the captain and the injured player of this penalty time and when EOC can now bat again. So at four o'clock the innings ended, there's a change of innings, side B will now bat at 10 past four. So now during that change of innings interval, part of your duties as the umpires, you need to go and inform the injured player as well as his or her captain, um, in this case John, you need to inform John's captain that he still he owes 60 minutes of penalty time. So side B's innings will start at 1610 uh, because the um, side A's innings ended at 1600. There'll be a 10 minute change of innings interval. So at 1610, um, the innings of side B will start. So you need to inform the captain that John owes 60 minutes of penalty time. So John can either bat at 1710 or at number seven, or the side needs to be five wickets down. If the side is five wickets down, let's say, um, I'll use first use, 17-10, uh, John can bat. Or John can bat, uh, let's say, at 16-40, the fifth wicket fell. The law allows for John to come in at 1640, even though he can only technically bet because his penalty time is an hour, but he can only bet at 1710. But a law allows, if a side is five wickets down, that the um, the injured player can come uh, out to bet if it's five wickets down. Uh, did I answer John's uh, Isaac's question, um, Tom? Uh, 100%, uh, Dula. Very happy with that answer. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. I see two hands up in the meeting room. First hand up is Asif. Asif, you may unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Tom and Abdullah and everybody. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of my questions already with you, 
uh, about uh, acceptance of uh, level one in Qatar. Yes. In Qatar, uh, yeah. I didn't uh, receive the answer yet. And the other one is the bank details. Are they okay now? Can I send the money? Pay the fee? Um, I can answer both of those questions for you, Asif. In the affirmative, I uh, got a uh, WhatsApp uh, message from um, the ICC Umpire Master Educator for Asia, who is based in Qatar. Um, her name uh, eludes me at the moment. Uh, Shivani, Shivani, that's, Shivani, that's Shivani. Her name. Yeah. and uh, Shivani did get back to me, and uh, she said yes. Um, Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring qualification is recognized in Qatar and you will be able to start umpiring once in Qatar once you have Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring certificate. Uh, I will send it to you and I will also send you Shivani's uh, email address for you once you've passed your exam and got your certificate to uh, engage with her to find out how to start umpiring in Qatar. That's your first question. Uh, your second question, um, I did reply to your second email about uh, bank account details. Uh, the address that is um, defaulted for First National Bank is the uh, head office of First National Bank in Santon, Johannesburg and uh, that address will work. Um, so use the rest of the bank account details that I send you uh, to perform the wire transfer. Okay, Happy thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Asif. Um, and uh, all of you uh, will see on my emails as well, underneath all of the uh, recording links and also the um, meeting invite links is payment details for the exam. Um, the deadline for payment for the exam is Sunday the 17th of December. Uh, but for those of you who want to get it out of the way soon, you are welcome to make payment anytime before Sunday, the 17th of December, 6 p.m. South African time. Next hand up is Ranveer Kumar. And I see uh, you're wearing your Indian shirt there, Ranveer. Uh, are you still uh, in mourning after the loss of the Cricket World Cup final to Australia? Or have you recovered emotionally from that? <laughs> Hey Tom, uh, good to see you. It is it is not Indian jersey. It is uh, my association jersey, Tom. Okay, Hyderabad Cricket Association. Brilliant. What's your question so I have, today? I have a couple of queries again, uh, Tom. So in a day in a multi-day game, uh, at the end of an innings, a fielder, a player has to be uh, served another ten minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of a lack of manpower, the change of innings interval uh, is uh, extended to 23 minutes. Mm -hmm. So now that player comes to umpires and asks that uh, as uh, innings break uh, is 10 minutes, it is extended to the 23 minutes. Can I open the batting now? So can he? Um. Good question, Ranveer. It, it does actually happen quite often in um, provincial cricket here in South Africa that a change of innings doesn't take 10 minutes. Why? Because uh, the team who will be batting next often request the heavy roller for seven minutes and the heavy roller needs to be started up. Sometimes if it's an old roller, it takes a long time to get to the middle and then they need to roll for seven minutes and then it takes another two or three minutes for the heavy roller to get off the field. So uh, I was officiating in a four day match from Thursday to Sunday and our change of innings took between 13 and 15 minutes uh, for the two change of innings that we had uh, in the middle of a session. Um, so Abdullah, 
we have a penalty time scenario where a fielder owes us 10 minutes at the end of their fielding innings. Uh, but the change of innings doesn't take 10 minutes. It takes 23 minutes because that roller broke down while it was going off the field and they had to push it off the field. And that's why it took 23 minutes for the change of innings. So Ranveer wants to know, because of the extra 13 minutes that the scheduled break lasted, are we now allowing that fielder who still owed us 10 minutes of penalty time to open the batting? Yes or no? No, indeed. The answer to your question is no. The clock only starts when play, <coughs> sorry, when play gets called. So once the innings of side B starts, that's when the clock starts. That's when the, the, the minutes will then start to tick down. Similarly to when a player uh, um, um, uh, uh, earns penalty time. It is only penal, uh, a playing time that gets uh, is, you know, seen as penal, penalty time. So you wouldn't be, be adding this um, lengthy, uh, I would say not interruption, but I mean, it took a while uh, for a change of innings uh, to take place. But yeah, uh, only start offsetting once the clock starts and the clock starts at the call of play once the inning starts. So yeah, it still needs to wait 10 minutes before EOC can bat again. Agreed, Tom. Your question? Yeah, Tom. I mean, Abdullah, thank you. I have a couple of, I mean, uh, I see uh, Arif is there. Yeah. If you can go with that. After that, uh, I'll, I'll just get back. Okay. I see if you've got your hand up again. Is that a new hand or was that the old hand still up? The same old hand. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Ranveer, that was an old hand from Asif. So um, you, you, there's no other hands. If you have uh, another question related to this evening's um, content, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in a delivery stride, bowler breaks the stump and only one bell is off. It is on the ground and batter after striking to the middle of fielder uh, settles for the first run. And in that course, uh, there is a direct hit from the fielder. The bell which was off from the stumps, it hits the only single stump. And the other bell is still on the stumps. And batter is uh, short of his ground. And even a stump is not stuck out of the ground. The only single stump which was uh, standing, I mean, uh, stumps were standing and ball hit just the, just the one stump. Mm. Which bell wasn't there? Is the batter out? Um, so the the stump without the bell is the one that is hit, and it has not been struck out of the ground. Yeah, correct. I think we dealt with this uh, very very scenario um, in a different lecture. Um, but Abdullah, do you want to take us through that uh, run out appeal, please? So, so Ranveer, to um, put this wicket down, you either need to remove the other bell. In your scenario, the other bell was not removed. So now to put the stump that's still in the ground that doesn't have the bell on, for you now to put the wicket down, you need to uproot that stump. And only if that stump is uprooted, can you um, adjudicate on the run out appeal? If the stump is still in the ground, whether it's sideways, whether if it's still in the, I don't know, still in the socket, I can't think of a better word, but if it's still in the ground, uh, that wicket is not down. So in that case, not out. Only if the stump is uprooted, then you can adjudicate on the. Agreed, Tom. Agreed. I mean, I'm Abdullah. Agreed, Abdullah. And the other query is regarding the wicketkeeper's movement. 
uh, have you have you seen the latest game of the india australia matthew wade in the last over i mean not latest game the one which maxwell uh, hit 100 uh, i was umpiring during that game so i didn't see it now yeah i was so in the last I okay so in the last over of the indian indian batting maxwell was bowling and matthew wade was actually going a couple of straight uh, steps backward to the spinner he was actually taking couple of steps backward so is that legal i've never I seen can actually that uh, forward your video uh, tom just a yes. moment give me a moment yeah i'll just forward your video right now can you add a video into the chat box by any chance uh i'm just forwarding you i mean if you could do that i've just sent you okay um ranveer in future if you could maybe send me videos before the lecture so that i'm able to um view them and also be able to share them um during the lecture so i am going to share my i am going to share my screen just bear with me Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Abdullah, we could keep as move backwards. Uh when does he move backwards? Let's just replay it again. Okay, so it looks like his first step is during um Maxwell's run up. What do you suggest Abdullah is that uh, illegal movement by the wicketkeeper or is that a minor adjustment to the position So so this is another of the um uh, judgment calls that the umpire needs to make and uh, we can just use what the law say how to guide us So the law say it's unfair for the wicketkeeper to significantly alter his or her position in in relation to uh, you know to the striker so now looking at this is it your opinion that Matthew Wade has significantly alter his position the answer to that question is yes then that is not allowed you need to call dead ball and you need to Uh, apply the rest of the the punishment for this uh penalty runs etc if your answer to that question is i don't think matthew has significantly alter his position then you'll allow play to uh proceed so it can be a judgment call i can i bet you some looking at this would say i don't think he really or he significantly alter his position and i probably off would say I think he has significantly altered his position. It's your judgment call. How you're looking at this? If that is significant to you, you need to apply the law. If not, you then uh, you then don't do anything. I'm not sure what the umpires did. Maybe the interpretation was that was not significantly altering his position. They just let it go. I'm not sure what the umpires did. Uh, they didn't do anything. Uh, the ball was counted. Oh. I just spoke to Madan sir, uh, the one who was uh, officiating. Uh, even I asked him uh, if it is a fair moment. He said me that he'll get back to me. And uh, I don't see that uh, law guides us, you know, move backward in, in the run-up. A yeah, couple of step, uh, steps, uh, I mean, coming forward for the slow delivery is allowed, but then backward, uh, I don't feel it is allowed. So I felt it is it is uh, illegal, but then. Yeah, so again, I just go on the words that the, that the law uses, and it uses significantly altering your position. 
That's what the law what would have been. Doesn't say forward. Done. It doesn't say it doesn't say back. Significantly mm -hmm. altering. So that's the judgment call you you need to make. According to you, that is significant altering his position. No problem. You've got the law to back you up. You can call in signal devil and apply uh, the law uh, for penalty runs in form and report. Andre. Thanks, Ranveer. We've got a question in the chat box about um, penalty time uh, from Shah. In a one day match in which in over rate penalties, uh, in match over rate penalties apply, the cutoff time when the last over should begin for the first session is 6.52. At 6.44, a player leaves the field for strapping with the umpire's permission. At 6.51, the last over starts and the player has left um, with the player still off the field. And the innings ends at 6.54. The captain of the side now batting or which is going to bat in the next over. Uh, approaches the umpire and asks what time the batter who left the field is entitled to bat. Uh, so this is a pretty straightforward um, penalty time calculation. Uh, let us assume that the one day match has a 30 minute um supper break so it would be from 654 until 724 p.m so can anybody guess or answer shah's question put your answer in the chat box what time can this fielder who is now whose team is now starting to bat at 7.24, what time can he bat? So let's go through the times, and I'm going to uh, ignore some of the information that Shah has given us because it's irrelevant. The relevant points are the fielder went off the field at 6.44, and the innings ended at 654 so how long was the fielder off the field? That's the first thing you need to ask yourself. Ranveer, I'm sure you can give us, show us with your hands the answer to that question. How long was the fielder off the field for? From 6.44 to 6.54? I'm just going through the question, uh, Tom. Uh... OK, no problem. Uh, anybody else can answer? Fielder was off the field for 10 minutes from 6.44 until the end of the their fielding innings, 6.40.54. So from 6.44 to 6.54 is 10 minutes. So he owes us 10 minutes of penalty time. Like Abdullah has mentioned to us, the change of innings or the supper break is not considered playing time it is a scheduled break so it does not count for or are against the fielder so Nitin, what time can that batter bat if the his batting innings the team's batting innings starts at 724 Nitin, please unmute your microphone the floor is yours Yes, sir. I'm also just going through the question only. The 7.20, I just missed out. Uh, 20, 10 minutes is the change over time. So after 10 minutes, uh, he can come out to back. After the wicket falls, uh, if within it the 10 minutes, after the 10 minutes, if any wicket falls, he can come out and on the batting. Uh, correct. So the correct. innings so needs to have been in progress for 10 minutes before the batter can bat. Okay, so if the 
innings starts at 7.24 because it's a 30-minute break for the supper break. Then the batter can bat at 7.44. Or if five wickets are down, whichever comes first. Okay. It's very unlikely that five wickets would fall before 10 minutes, but for the complete answer in an exam question that you need to write the full answer for, you must always add or five wickets down, whichever comes first. Okay, Shah, thank you for the question. And to everybody else, thank you for your attendance and participation. Uh, very, very big reminder that to, there is no lecture on Wednesday. The next lecture is tomorrow uh, because Abdullah will be making his women's T20 international debut on Wednesday at 6 p.m. South African time. So we have to have the lecture on Tuesday, 6 p.m. South African time. Also tomorrow, Karen Claster, our Poster Girl will be joining us and she will be sharing a match preparation presentation. So please all join us for that 6 p.m. South African time. I will send the link out tonight so you've got it ready for tomorrow. Um, and also I will try and send out the recording of this lecture uh, tonight as well. Uh, Ranveer, you've got your hand up again. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours for the last question of the night. Yeah, Tom, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, there is no shot offered, Tom. Mm. There is no shot offered and uh, ball is deflected by the pad. And uh, batter actually uh, goes for the second run. Empire, however, miss, misses that uh, calling a dead ball after the completion of first run. The batter crosses for the second run, and there is a run out appeal at the striker's end. How would you uh, handle this? Empire hasn't called dead ball after the completion of first run. Both the empires have missed it. Uh, the umpires need to know their laws, uh, Ranveer, and uh, be aware of such situations. Uh, Abdullah, I've never seen that before. Uh, do you have an answer for Ranveer's run out appeal? No, that runner should never have counted uh, because the ball, according to law, is dead upon the completion of the first run. If the umpires don't know this law and they gave this batter out, uh, it's just unfortunate. And nothing we can do about it. They're not aware of the law that the ball became dead. But according to the law, the ball became dead upon completion of that first run. So anything that happened after that is... Uh, irrelevant. irrelevant. That should not be given up. Thank you, Abdullah. And, uh, good luck to you. Congratulations on your debut. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, everybody. We'll meet up again, same time, same place, tomorrow night. Different Microsoft Teams meeting link. Have a good night further. And see you tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye. Good night and thank you. Bye, everyone. Both of you. Bye. Good night, sir.